What's up everyone, this is Heiss, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. I've realized over the past couple weeks and the past couple of videos that I have a lot of viewers on the channel who have varying degrees of knowledge about steam locomotives, and I thought it would be a good time to take a look at a steam locomotive and try and dissect, you know, several different levels of understanding about what a steam locomotive is. So I have here a picture of Denver and Rio Grande Western 491, midway through restoration, as it were, which is why it looks a little odd and paint is here and there. But anyways, um, if you look at this and you don't know all the little details and the nerdy things that I know or some of us in the industry know, you see a steam locomotive. But I see rods and spring rigging and a boiler and piping and all of these different things. And I talk about them very casually in many of my videos, assuming that everyone knows about these. And I recognize that many of you do not. So I wanted to talk through kind of 10 different levels of understanding of how steam locomotives work. So here we have level zero. It's a locomotive. There it is. So let's start with level one. Level one understanding is that we have some fire and then we have some water and fire plus water makes the water turn into steam. If you were to boil something on your stove, you can make this happen. You can create steam if you're making pasta or whatever, but the steam just kind of gently floats away and that's that. But in the case of our locomotive, we have a boiler that can contain that steam. So the steam is all contained. And if the steam is contained, it can build pressure. We keep the fire, we keep the water, we're trying to make more steam. We run out of space to put the steam in. And so the steam starts to pressurize inside the boiler. And then pressurized things can cause movement. If you've ever blown something across your desk with some compressed air or computer cleaning materials, you'll know what I mean. What if, rather than taking at the compressed air and blowing something across our desk, we take compressed steam and push on a big piston? And what if there was a rod connected to the piston that we could then connect to our wheels? We can move a locomotive. And that is level one understanding. You take a fire, you take water, fire makes the water turn into steam, steam creates pressure, pressure can move a piston, which can then move rods, which can turn wheels, and you have a train. So we know level one, now what is level two? Level two is understanding that that fire from level one lives inside of a box called the firebox, which you've probably heard about. And this firebox has to be surrounded by water on all sides, because the fire in a steam engine can get so hot, the fire can actually start to damage the firebox in an explosive way. So we have a side view and we have a top view. Uh, on the top, you can see that the firebox is inside the boiler and it's surrounded by water. And on the side, you can see that again, we're surrounded by water all the way, including the top. Because the fire can get so hot that it can break the firebox, you have to keep water covering all of it to make sure it can cool down so that the heat from the fire goes through the firebox into the water, which then helps to make the steam. Fire also needs air. So the bottom of the firebox allows air in. And so you have air that then travels into the fire, allowing combustion to happen. But then where does it go from there? Fire also makes smoke. And smoke typically needs to go somewhere, right? You can't smother the fire with your own smoke. So actually what you have now in red is you have flues and tubes, which are basically fancy words for pipes, that run from the firebox to the left to the smoke box at the front over here. So as the engine works, air gets drawn in, it makes the fire stronger, and then the exhaust gases travel through these flues and tubes to the smoke box where they then come out the stack, which is why you can see varying colors of smoke come out of the smokestack. The steam that we talked about in level one that drives the piston, the steam, when it finishes pushing the piston, then comes into the smoke box and exhausts through a little nozzle called the blast nozzle. And this also sends its exhaust out the stack. So your stack is a mixture of your steam from the cylinder and as well, the fire exhaust. 
That is why sometimes you will see white coming out the stack. Sometimes you'll see black. It all depends on what the fire is doing and what the engine is doing and the temperature outside. Okay, so that's level two. We have kind of a good understanding now of what the boiler does and what the fire does and, and how everything sits. So how do those rods that we talked about in the piston actually make the locomotive move? There is a lot of rods on one of these. Let's start with the ones that actually drive the locomotive. Inside here, we have the piston. The piston is connected to the piston rod right here in red. And then this connects to the main rod now in yellow. The main rod is the big one that connects the piston to the driving wheels. And if you only had one wheel, you'd connect to the one wheel right here and the main rod could just drive it. But we have a lot of wheels. So we also have connecting rods or side rods now in blue. And it's hard to see with everything else here, but they connect all four of these driving wheels we have on this side. And that makes up all of the rods that actually provide power to the locomotive. There's a lot more. You can see that there's a lot more, but those do not provide power. They provide timing. The steam engine is an engine. Think about it like it's the engine in your car. Your engine in your car has valves that allow the fuel and air to come in, and it has exhaust valves that let the exhaust out. We have the same thing on a steam engine. It just looks a heck of a lot bigger and it's on the outside rather than on the inside so you can see it in motion which is one of the really cool things about a steam locomotive and, and why I love them so much. So the rest of this stuff is what we call valve gear because the primary purpose of all these rods other than the driving ones we talked about is to move the valve. In the case of 491 from the outside the valve looks very similar to the main cylinder and piston but on the inside it's quite a bit different where you have two different sets of seals in something that kind of looks like a dog bone. So you have seals on the left side and the right side, and you can put steam in the middle, and as you move the valve left and right, you can pick which channel the steam is going to go down. So the valve's job is to move back and forth and tell which channel the steam needs to go down to push the piston in the direction we want to. Right now, if we wanted the locomotive to move forwards, we would need to push on this side of this piston. So we'd be pushing towards the right and it would pull the rods and start the wheels moving this way. And so we would need the valve to be over on the right side to let steam in on the left. All these rods that are part of the valve gear determine how that happens and why. First, we have the eccentric crank right here. And the eccentric crank sets the angle offset between the valve and the main piston. When the main piston is in the middle of its power stroke, right in the center, the valve needs to be all the way to one side or all the way to the other side to allow the maximum amount of steam in and shove this piston one way or another as much as it can. But when the piston is all the way at the back or all the way at the front, we need the valve in the middle because we need to be saying, hey, we need to be transitioning steam to the other side so that we can push this thing the other way. So to do that, with the way that the math works out, you need to offset them by about 90 degrees when you're talking about a circle. And so we have this eccentric crank, which sets the offset. The eccentric crank in red is attached to the eccentric rod, which is in orange. And this is just a link to connect to the expansion link which is in green. This is kind of the star of the show as far as this kind of valve gear. Uh, there are many different kinds of valve gear. The one that I'm explaining is called the Walshart's valve gear. This pivots in the middle. So when the top moves to the right, the bottom moves to the left. And as such, we have the next rod in blue, the radius rod. And the Johnson bar in the cab that you have in Railroads Online, when you push it forward, it actually pushes the radius rod down. So the radius rod will end up looking like this. But if you bring it back towards you, it pushes it up. So it looks like that. And what happens there is that when you push it down, you are below the pivot. And so your rods are moving in conjunction with the crank as they go. So as this moves the left, so does this, so does everything. But if you go in reverse, 
pull it back towards you, it moves opposite because it's on the opposite side of the pivot. And this is how you can pick forwards or reverse. And it's also how you set the length of motion of the valve. If you're far down in the bottom of the expansion link, you move a lot, lot of pivoting motion. But if you're very close to the center, you don't move hardly at all. And that is how you can gain efficiency by making the valve move less. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Anyways, this rod is the radius rod, the one in the blue. Now, in the kind of pinkish purple color, we have the combination lever, which attaches to the union link in the hot pink color. And now, locomotives will operate without these two pieces, albeit not very nicely. This helps stabilize the motion of the valve relative to the piston to keep everything happy. So Discord user Wings and Strings has made a brilliant animation of the Walsh Arts valve gear. Wings and Strings is actually helping me out with the soundtrack these days. He's a brilliant bluegrass player, and we're going to feature him on some tracks coming soon. So stay tuned for that. But anyways, back to the valve gear. His animation really shows off how this works in motion, so hopefully this will help you understand it better. So you can see we're running forwards. The Johnson bar's all the way forward. The radius rod's down, and you can see the radius rod moves with the eccentric rod. Same direction, same time. And now we're centering up the Johnson bar. No motion. Let's look. Here's the valve. You can see what side the steam is going to be admitted to based on the position of the valve. Reverse or forwards. And now you can see the power stroke coming from the inside, pushing the piston one direction or another. And now you can see why it's called the Johnson bar, not just the reverser. As you bring the bar closer to center, it limits the travel of the valve, but keeps the motion, allowing steam to admit the same side, but for less time, which is useful for high-speed applications. And now in reverse, you can see that we're on the opposite side of the pivot. We're now moving in the radius rod opposite of the eccentric rod. And you can see that now the wheels are moving in reverse, steam is admitted to the other side. And as we flip it to forward, Bang! We start going the other way, admitting steam on the other side at the same time. So that is all of level 3. Let's do a quick recap. Level 1, we have fire, we have water, together they make steam. We take the steam, we push a piston, wheels turn. Level 2, we know that we need to keep the firebox surrounded with water so we can make as much steam as we can, and also so the locomotive doesn't explode. And then we need to make sure we have air to make a good fire, and that it can exhaust out the stack. And then we need to be able to take the steam we've made and push a bunch of rods to make it happen and give us options for how we use the steam. But how does the steam get to the valve in the first place? Enter the throttle and level four. So here in level four, we understand that the boiler is this chunk in black. And the boiler has what is called the steam dome. And it's called the steam dome because it's physically a part of the boiler. And inside the steam dome, for many locomotives, lives the throttle body, which is in red. And the throttle valve in orange is controlled by the lever in the cab. And as you pull the lever in the cab out, it, it pulls on this rod, which pulls on a bell crank, which raises the throttle valve itself. And when the throttle valve raises, the steam inside the boiler is allowed to enter through the bottom and the top. There are two different seats, and they flow through the throttle body into what is called the dry pipe. It's called the dry pipe because you hope it remains dry, because if it gets actual water in it, problems can happen very quickly. And now we get to one of the fascinating technologies that is not existent on any of the locomotives in railroads online, but was a huge thing for efficiency and later steam. In the case of 491, we enter what is called the superheater header in green. And the superheater header has a number of superheater units, also in green, where the steam flows into the header, gets divided into a bunch of small pipes that runs down the exhaust tubes that we talked about in level 2, and then return back to the header, where it is then recollected and sent down the purple-colored tube to the valve. So why is this called a superheater? Well, those exhaust gases get very, very hot when the engine's working really hard. And so you can take steam, which is at a mixture of 200 PSI and about 400 degrees Fahrenheit inside the boiler, and then you can take it and run it through those super hot exhaust gases that were previously hot enough to break the firebox like we talked about. And you can take the steam and superheat it because it is now just steam. It is no longer steam and water. 
you could superheat it up to 700, 800 degrees and put that into your valve and then piston, which allows for a significant amount more expansion. The engines in Railroads Online do not have superheaters. So what they do is they just cut the pipes out and you just go there. Very easy. Now, some of the big, big engines, the ones that you guys really like, the big boy even, and a lot of the other modern super powered engines, they don't have their throttles in the steam dome at all. Mm -mm. They have a throttle that is attached to the superheater header, basically. It's called a front end throttle, which is why you'll see in pictures of the big boy and other big locomotives that there's a, a rod, just like this one that we talked about, that runs on the outside of the boiler, goes to a pivot, that then goes in at the smoke box. And that's actually the external throttle rod running to the front end throttle. The benefits of this is that you can take your steam, not through a throttle body, but through a pickup point at the driest location, AKA the steam dome, the top point of the boiler. And you can take that steam, run it through the superheaters, have it pre-superheated, and then feed it through the throttle so that you cut out all of the piping in your control and you get pretty much instantaneous response. Whereas on engines like 491 and the other Ks on the narrow gauge, uh, <laughs> you make an adjustment at the throttle and then you have to wait for the steam to do the thing before it gets there and exhausts out. So you have to be a little bit ahead of the curve, which is what makes running those engines interesting. But that covers most of the throttle setups on these different kinds of locomotives. The reason that getting water in the dry pipe is bad is because water is what we call incompressible. You can't squeeze water and make it smaller. You can do that with steam, it just makes the pressure a lot higher, but water wants to occupy the same volume. And if you then take it through the dry pipe and run it into the engine, uh, if you try to squeeze the water with your piston rings on your piston and your valve, you no longer have piston rings or valve rings or cylinder heads or valve covers. Uh, everything gets blown off the front. Or in the case of a superheated locomotive, if you get water in here, you get water that dumps into the superheater and it really flashes to steam very quickly, which means that you get a lot of steam that you have no way of controlling because it is just doing chemically things to become steam. And you can shut the throttle valve, but you still got all that water pouring through there and uh, you do what is called a steam locomotive burnout in the industry. So what's level five? Well, level five is talking about how the boiler is actually constructed because you got to remember that these boilers were built a long time ago and they didn't have all the techniques of construction we have today. There was no welding yet. There was gas welding that came on a little bit later, but boilers are primarily riveted together. So how do you build one? How are they put together? Well, you have basically two sections and that you have the firebox, which we'll just kind of cut off right there. And then you have the boiler barrel, which is the circular bit. Now, the barrel is made of rolled sheets of steel. So they take a big flat piece of steel and they pinch it between two or three giant rolling machines. And then they slowly roll it into a circular shape like this. But they can only do it with pieces so wide. And so boilers tend to need to be made out of multiple sections, which we call courses. So in the case of 491, we have the first course the second course, and then the wrapper sheet slash firebox and all that stuff. It's not really a third course, but anyway. And along these seams, we have rivet seams. A great boiler maker once said that boilers are just big iron pairs of pants. Much like your pants have seams in them with stitches, we have seams in our boilers with metal stitches, aka rivets. And a rivet is basically what looks like a bolt when, it, when you start and uh, it's, it looks like, you know, it looks like a bolt, but there's no threads and you heat it up until it's glowing red and glowing orange. You stuff it in a hole between two sheets and you squeeze it to death with a couple pneumatic air guns and it basically fills the hole completely. So you'll end up with, you know, two sheets of boiler material overlapping like this. You've got a hole between them. You stick the hot rivet in as it exists and it's got the one head on it already one rivet gun on one side you put another rivet gun or a backing bar on the other side and you squeeze it together until the final thing ends up with just a head on the outside and a head on the inside and then the middle piece just kind of squeezes out until it seals the hole and that's how a rivet works and you do that enough times and you end up with a boiler with all of these things riveted together but how do you seal 
a single course, well, you have what is called a butt seam. You have uh, the joining of the two ends because they came from a flat piece of steel that they rolled, but then there's the gap at the top. You can't make it recontinuous. So they put a second piece on the outside of the inside and they put extra little rivets along it to hold the two pieces together. And typically they would have an internal diamond-shaped doubler to help uh, distribute the stresses. Now next, what about that steam dome? How is the steam dome a part of the boiler? Well, this is actually a quite a neat piece of engineering for the early day. The steam dome is usually made out of about three or four pieces. You have the shoulder that transitions to the boiler. It looks like this. You have the actual side wall up the top, and then you have another shoulder to go to the top. Then there's the hole inside uh, so that you can actually get in through the steam dome, perform maintenance. And then you have the lid that goes on top. And the lid is held down with the studs and bolts, and you can actually see that in the picture 491. And you can see the rivet seam holding the uh, the vertical section of the barrel of the steam dome to the top shoulder. Now, so they make these, the two shoulders, by pressing a very thick piece of steel into a big die. So they had a massive, basically, ram that they would just stick into the right shape and force the steel into the shape. So you had the, the negative of what you needed, and then you had the positive that was smaller than you needed, and you wedged the steel between... And when you started to press down really hard, you ended up with a piece of steel that looked like what you needed. Circular on top with a circular hole and sloped up and down to match. But now, how did they get the boiler sheet to interface with that then rolled section? Well, this is actually the neat piece of engineering. So before they would roll the sheet, they had had their big flat piece. They would drill a bunch of holes really close together around there. And then they would roll the sheet. Now, why did they do that? Well, you don't really want to drill afterwards because this is not flat. You can't guarantee that you can drill through it because it's not a flat surface. You'd have a hard time getting the bit started. Um, you know, so you'd rather have the hole pre-made. And you want the, the added strength of rolling the material. So why not just cut the shape out? Well, if you cut the whole thing out and just have a hole like this, it's really weak right at that middle point, and you end up with a warped piece of steel when you roll it, you don't get the strength. But if you drill lots of little holes really close to each other, you can then roll it and have almost the same strength, because it's still connected in a fair bit of places. You can make the shape you need, and then you could beat this to death with a hammer until it falls out. I'm sure they used a torch as well and cut it out. But here's a picture of me in a steam dome, and you can see all of the little drill marks. It looks like someone's been biting away at the boiler. But no, that was how they did it. They had that extra piece that, you know, they had to, they had to drill all those little holes, and that was what it looked like after they hammered it out. Okay, so we know that that's how the steam dome interfaces. We know about our seams between our courses. We know about butt seams now that connect the individual pieces together. Well, now, how does that whole firebox thing work out? So I'm going to switch to a slightly lighter color. Your firebox sits inside, and it's totally a, a separate piece, right? It's like an inner wall of the boiler, and it has to connect. When you have lots of pressure, pressure wants to make things go away in a pretty uniform way. You have water pressure and steam pressure pressing on this firebox, trying to make it, you know, squish into something uniform which you don't want to do. So you have to bolt it together to the rest of the boiler. And so you have bolts. You have a lot of bolts, actually. They're called stay bolts, and they connect the two sheets. They are threaded into the firebox and threaded into the boiler sheet. So they're actually kind of like a stud in that regard where they don't have a, necessarily have a head. They're threaded into both the firebox and the boiler, and they connect them. And you have special long ones called crown stays on top go out radially and make sure that the firebox can hold its shape. Because while the barrel is quite strong and can hold itself just by its geometry, when you're trying to have a square shape, steam doesn't like that. And water doesn't like that. And pressure doesn't like that. So we have all these bolts to hold it all in the way that we need. And as we talked about in one of my DRL Valley videos, you also had kinds of bolts called flexible bolts, where they're bolted into the firebox and screwed into the firebox, but then they have a big head on the outside that just allows the sheet to pivot around. And when you have a whole grid of these bolts, the sheet's constrained the, just the way if, as if they were threaded. But as you expand and contract, because the boiler does grow with temperature, you get that motion without causing any breakage. 
and then that's why they have a cap over top to seal it because these don't necessarily seal as well as just something that's bolted right in. Now an important feature of these bolts is that they're actually drilled all the way through. They're hollow. If you look on them, they have a little dot in the center. And that actually, when brand new, goes all the way through to the inside, but typically they get plugged with gunk all the way and you don't have long enough drill bits to drill them out and whatnot. But anyways, the point is, if one of them breaks for whatever reason, if you have a failure, water will leak out either out the outside or the inside and it'll clear the blockages because it's under high pressure. And so you'll see with leaking water if you have a leaking bolt. That way you know that you need to go fix something. There's also what we call bracing in boiler design where sometimes you have to run braces to hold different parts together. So you'll have braces that run from the front tube sheet diagonally to different points down the barrel to hold things together and hold the tube sheet shapes in or the back head shape in. You'll have these braces that run along as well. And when I say tube sheet, it is the vertical sheet that all the tubes and flues run through. So remember we talked about in step two, level two, we have all these tubes and flues that run through in the middle of this. It's quite complicated, isn't it? So they have to run through and go from firebox to smoke box, and those are pressure sealing. So we have to make sure that those tube sheets also stay. The pressure wants to make them a nice half of a circle like this, or, you know, throw them free. But those are also riveted internally with rivet seams, and they're held in place with those braces. So now we know a little bit about boiler geometry. It gets more complicated than that and more in-depth than that, particularly when you get to crazy shapes down the road, but that's a, a quick crash course and I'm not an expert boiler maker by any means. So there's, there's much more detail that goes into it as you go further. Now that we know how the boiler is put together, how is it attached to everything else? We know we have a smoke box up at the front and the smoke box is just riveted to the boiler. It has a rivet seam to the boiler just like we had before, but now there's no pressure in the smoke box. The smoke box then is attached to the cylinder saddle. Kind of looks looks vaguely like this from the front, and then there's this contour up like this, and it matches, and then there's lots of bolts that hold the smoke box on to the saddle, and they're actually big, big, big tapered bolts that you drive in, and tapered means that rather than being just totally straight, they, they go in at angles as you go down them so that they kind of wedge themselves in place, and that holds the smoke box to the cylinder saddle up front, so this is all rigidly connected. But I talked about the boiler growing. And depending on the locomotive, some of them can get like two inches longer because as you heat up, metal expands. And if you're at, you know, 200, 300 PSI, you've got a lot of pressure and temperature. So you expand quite a bit. But where does that expansion go? We're fixed up here, so we need to expand backwards. So the rear of the firebox isn't actually rigidly connected to the frame. In the case of 491, we have uh, basically skates, nice machine surfaces for the firebox to slide on. They're called shoes, and it slides backwards on them as it expands. Some of the early engines had dog bone links where you had, you know, a connection and then another connection down to the frame, and then as it would expand, it could pivot back. Those were an older style, but not necessarily as good. But that's what, like, engines like 346 and 20 have, but the bigger engines got nice machined skates for them to slide on, and you need to make sure you keep those oiled, because um, the first time they expand in a long time, 491. They make a lot of fun sounds. Okay, so that's level five. Now what about level six? We just learned a heck of a lot about the boiler and how the boiler works and how the boiler's constructed, but what about the frame? What about the running gear? How does all of that work? Well, it's a bit complicated as well, right? We're, we're getting down into the more advanced levels of things. We're now in level six at this point. So you have frame rails that run all the way down the locomotive. And they're quite complicated in their geometry. But the, the point is, is that you have the rear frame extension back here, where the trailing truck lives on 491. You have the frame split off into a, a main rail up top, and then kind of a second rail on bottom with what are called binder straps that you can remove, because you have to be able to take the axles out somehow, right? If you got to do wheel work or anything like that. And then they recombine and then go up to the front where they connect so that you can distribute the pulling forces all the way through this and also distribute the forces of the locomotive down the frame. So if we were to look at a close look, the drive wheel has an axle in the center, naturally, that runs all the way across. And that axle has a bearing on top of it that distributes the weight of the locomotive onto the axle and allows for smooth rotation. This bearing is what we call a crown brass because it's on top. It's made out of brass. Very exciting. And it sits within what is called the driving 
box, which is a journal box, but we call it a driver box or driver driving box, journal box, main box. There's lots of different names for them, but it is the actual member that rides up and down in between the frame and takes the load from the driver and distributes it to the frame. So you have the frame rail over top, you have the box, and the box is allowed to float a little bit up and down inside the frame as things happen in the suspension. And you have what are called the shoes and the wedge. You have a shoe on front. It allows for a wear surface for the box to travel up and down. You have the shoes and wedge, and the wedge is on back, and it's tapered like this. So as you tighten a bolt that's in the binder strap, you can raise the box up that taper, and it pushes it forwards. And you need that because you have side rods. You have connecting rods. You need them to be the right length so that all the wheels connect and can transmit forces correctly. So you need all the boxes to be the same distance apart. So you need to be able to, as things wear, tighten them up and make sure that that is all connected. So you have a bolt in the bottom that presses on this and moves it up, which moves it forward to keep everything tight. And you need to have that set very precisely so that it's not too tight or too loose. Uh, and you have all the right tolerances for operation. So you have met all these boxes in the frame inside there you have your binder straps which are held on with number of bolts and they've got that bolt that's an adjustment bolt that we typically call a lollipop at least for the rear grand stuff because it's got what looks like a lollipop it's got a big head on the bottom it looks just like a lollipop and even in 2d it's flat the other way um if you were to rotate it and it uh, and that's how you adjust all of your driving boxes there well so how does the frame then take those forces from the driving boxes and distribute the, you know, the weight of the locomotive to them. Well, we have what's called spring rigging, where you have, again, a saddle that rides over the top of the frame member, and it's U-shaped so that uh, it gets clearance over the frame. The frame rail looks like this. You have the driving box like this, and then the saddle sits on the box, but straddles the frame member. And then on top of the saddle, you have a pin, a little circular pin. And on top of that, you have a big leaf spring which ends up acting as both a spring and also a transmission bar because it can rotate and it can bend. It's connected to a lot of other leaf springs and levers to help distribute the load in the locomotive spring rigging, aka suspension. You have what's called a dead block in the frame here that prevents the suspension from moving. And now in orange, you have a spring hanger that runs from the dead block and is pinned to the dead block, runs over the leaf spring, which is now in blue. And then you have another hanger, just like the previous, and it runs down, but instead of running to a dead block, it runs to a fulcrum lever in green that can transmit force. And then you have another hanger, as you can see, and then you have another leaf spring, etc. You go down and down, and, and it's grouped up in basically a tripod setting. And I talked about this in one of my railroads online playthroughs, where you have the left back and the right back set up. So this is all connected all the way through to the trailing truck as part of the spring rigging. Your other dead block is back above the frame over here. And then you have the front, which is all connected together. And it's just like this, except when you get to the front edge of the driver number one, you have from the top view, you get to driver number one, then you have what's called the transverse equalizer, which connects you across to the other side of the locomotive. You'll have a connection down to the sword equalizer, which looks like a sword, shocker. And that runs to the lead truck. So the lead truck can connect here. It runs back with pivots to the transverse equalizer here, which then runs down the rest of the spring rigging down the front axle. So the, the whole front of the locomotive is set up as one unit. And obviously this is very different depending on each locomotive. And I'm just giving an example for this kind of locomotive because talking through everyone, I mean, every single locomotive type is set up differently. So this is just the overall principle of it. But the idea is, if you were to get to a low spot in the track, this box would need to drop down. And as it drops down, so does this leaf spring, and it'll rotate, because this is fixed and this length is fixed. It'll rotate, which caused this to go down, which lets the lever pivot, which then causes this to raise up, which causes the next lever to go down, which causes the next driver spring to rotate and put more of a moment on this chunk of frame. So as all of a sudden you lose the weight on this driver as it drops down into a hole, you can transfer that weight to the next driver down to ensure that you keep traction over any bit of rough track. And that's quite a neat piece of engineering, don't you think? So that's quite a very crash course on running gear. And I will admit that my running gear knowledge is pretty limited. Um, I never got to take apart a lot of this stuff. 
um, just because I wasn't there for the, the days we did it or I wasn't part of the project yet uh, when we did take some of these pieces apart. So there are a lot of people in the industry that have a better knowledge than me on a lot of this stuff, particularly running gear wise. But um, if you have corrections or different terms or anything you've heard, if you're in industry, by all means, let me know. I'm, I'm always happy to learn more and be able to share more with you guys. So that was level six. Shall we shall we run through them a bit uh, one more time because that's uh, that's been a, a whole mouthful I think so level one fire water steam rotation level two we need air for a fire we need to protect the fire with water so we can make more steam not explode and we need to be able to exhaust level three we need to be able to take our steam and use rods to actually harness it and make movement happen level four. We need to be able to get that steam to those rods and valves in the right way. Level five, we need to have a boiler that is built correctly so that we can actually harness the steam pressure, not have leaks or other failures. And level six, we need to have a frame for it all to be connected to, and we need a way for the wheels to be able to maintain keeping on the track and also ensure that everything is rolling smoothly. So what is level seven? We talked about in level two that we needed water about the firebox. So as we boil water, the water goes away. How do we get more? Well, we have these beautiful things called injectors. The injectors on 491 are located down here these big brass things. So there are a lot of different types of injectors and they all vary per locomotive, but we're gonna go over a basic theory of how it works. This is a typical live steam injector, non-lifting type. There's also a lifting type, but you take steam from the turret, which we will talk about shortly. You take steam from the turret and you run it down to a starting valve. Sometimes this is combined with the injector itself, particularly in lifting types. But anyways, when you pull this lever in the cab, it allows steam to start flowing down this pipe to the injector. And when you allow steam to start flowing, it starts to pull water through this hose connected to the tender down what is called the suction line and start running it out of the overflow onto the ground. And once you have the water overflowing on the ground, you've got flow established based on that steam power. You can then close the overflow and force the water and steam mixture up the delivery line through a check valve into the boiler. And the way that the check valve operates is that um, it is a steam pressure valve. Boiler pressure holds it closed, but when you hit it, basically with velocity, uh, you know, and speed of the water coming down the pipe and the st same steam pressure again, the pressure plus velocity is enough to pop it open and start putting water in the boiler. And when you shut the injector off, you remove the pressure boiler pressure pushes the check valve back closed. So that is a very, very basic overview of how an injector takes water from the tender and puts it into the boiler. There's a lot more nuance than that, and particularly dependent on the kind of valves you have, everything's quite different and operates differently. But I talked about the turret earlier. Is that where the machine guns are? Well, no. The turret is where the up other appliances get their steam on a locomotive. So you've seen typically a uh, kind of a box with a bunch of valves on it. That's what the turret is. It's a box with a bunch of valves on it. And this is where you get all of your accessory steam and you can categorize it all in one place. So typically you'll have a pipe again from the steam dome that then runs to the turret so that you get the cleanest steam with the least amount of water in it, which is always funny, right? Dry steam theoretically, even though it's still Look, you know, it's still water. Um, and you'll run that pipe to the turret, and then it's basically a manifold where you have all of your appliances running. And when I say appliances, I don't mean your fridge or your microwave. I mean your starting valve for your injector, electric generator, also known as a dynamo, which just gets steam run through a turbine, and then it, you know, turns a, a commutator that makes electricity happen. You have your air compressor on the other side of the locomotive in this case, but it gets its steam from there as well. You also have your hydrostatic lubricator, uh, depending on locomotive type, and everything gets its steam for that. Level eight, the air compressor. Why do we need air in a steam locomotive. It's a steam locomotive, not an air locomotive, right? Well, we need air for a lot of different reasons. So uh, in this picture, of course, the air compressor is on the other side, but the main reservoir and radiator piping looks the same. So the air comes over in this pipe over here, and it runs through what's called radiator piping, 
which allows the air to cool because if it's been in a steam powered piston, it's quite hot and will have a lot of moisture. So we want to make sure we want to cool it down so we can use it. And then we store it in a reservoir we call the main reservoir, typically 130, 150 PSI, somewhere in there. And we have drains on the main reservoir, so you can get rid of the water at least once a day. Hence the drain daily tags that you'll see on these, typically. And then we take the air from there, and we run it to various things on the locomotive. What are the various things? Well, we have air-powered sanders. Runs from the main reservoir via another manifold in the cab. There's a valve. There's a line underneath the boiler jacketing. So there's insulation and then a, a polished nice jacket here, of course. There's a line that runs underneath and pops up. You can see both of them right there. Pops up to run the sanders. This is called the sand dome. It is full of sand. Shocker. <laughs> when you apply air pressure, it forces the sand down these two pipes. And depending on which valve you open, uh, there's a bunch of different styles. But in the case of 491, you either get two, just the lead, or you get all four. And the pipe runs down and it deposits the sand ahead of the number one wheel and then ahead of the number three wheel in the case of 491. Some have forwards and backwards sanders. Uh, some only have one. There's lots of different flavors, but you get the idea. So we use the air for the sand. We also have an air ringer for our bell. There's a little pneumatic cylinder inside the bell that allows the, uh, <laughs> the bell clapper to just sit there and hit the bell, which is why you'll hear some locomotives just go ding, 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 ding because it's air powered rather than mechanical although some early locomotives also had a big piston pneumatic piston outside that made a swinging air ringer so they still sound like they're being rung by a cord but they're actually being rung by a swinging ringer which is a a, a total pain of a mechanism to deal with but anyways Moving on. We also need air for the brakes. We have locomotive brakes and tender brakes and train brakes, right? That's what you've heard in games before. But in the industry, we call them independent brakes and automatic brakes. The independent brakes set up the driving wheel brakes and the tender brakes. And the automatic brakes set up everything. That's why a lot of times you watch an engineer and he'll hold the independent brake released while he sets up the automatic brake so that it keeps the engine and tender released while the train sets up to keep everything stretched out. But there are two big pistons in here that are hidden, you can't see them, and there's not really a great way to get a good picture of them either, that ram some arms that set up a bunch of linkage called brake rigging that apply brake shoes on the front of these wheels. And that is what actually slows down the the, uh, the train. You have brake shoes, it's like an, an external drum brake, but it, rather than it being a drum, it's the wheel. It's kind of like an old drum brake in a car. Rather than the shoes being inside, they're on the outside. Similar thing on the tender, the brake cylinder that then applies force to all the linkage that then applies the brake shoes to the wheels. And then you have the automatic brake, which controls the equalizing reservoir on the train, which is located under the cab, also hard to see, which then impacts what the brake pipe does that runs down the whole train. And that is a whole nother video. We could talk for an hour just on automatic air and how it works and all the different types. So if you like what's going on in this video and you think it's interesting, uh, if you want to learn more about how train brakes and automatic brakes work, I'll do another one of these and we'll, we'll just talk about the different levels of understanding for air brakes. That's too much to get into. But long story short, you have a valve in the cab and it controls the brakes on the train with similar linkages and pistons as we talked about uh, in this level. And the last thing that we really need air for on this locomotive is for the fire door. You press a pedal and it'll open the fire door for you so you can focus on throwing the coal where you need to. But not every locomotive has a pneumatic fire door, and why is that? Well, on to level 9. Level 9. All the way back at the beginning in level 1, we started with a fire. Well, how does the fire actually happen? Things burn. Very exciting, right? Combustion. So there are a number of different types of fuel sources for locomotives. So you get different flavors of fire. In the case of 491, you have a coal burning locomotive. So your firebox back in the rear here is a fire door, which is an opening in the boiler. And then the pneumatic valve controls the actual door itself on the exterior. You have to shovel coal into the firebox, into the fire, which is all in here, to make things happen. But it's more complicated than that, because of course it is. The firebox floor is actually made up of grates, which that doesn't sound too complicated. I've got a barbecue at home. What does a grate look like? A grate on a steam engine is usually made out of a big hunk of cast iron. There's a number of different types, but um, the kind that 491 have are basically a big, thick slab with a tang on it with a hole in the bottom of the tang. And if you look at it from the top, 
it's a big, long, narrow thing with a bunch of holes in it, basically. So that there's a grid work of holes all the way around this that allows the air to come through. And then the coal sits on top. And the reason that there is this tang with the hole in it is that when you get a whole lineup of these grates, 491 has 18 grates in four different quadrants. So if you look at it from the top, there's the rear grates back here and the front grates and then the left and the right. So, you know, you've got this divided up into however many, you know, pieces and you have controls to dump the grates for each of these quadrants. And the way that that works is that there's a series of rods that run from levers in the cab that then run underneath the firebox and connect to all of those tangs so that when you push the lever one way or another, you grab the tang and pull it that way or that way, and then the actual grate rotates. It's got uh, little tongues that stick out and sit on the side bearers and center bearers in the firebox. And so they pivot and then you can dump the fire into the ash pan, which is down below. And then when the locomotive is done operating for the day or you're waking it up in the morning, you can go to an ash pit, such as this rudimentary one that we had in the picture before we built the real one. Um, and then you can dump the ashes out the bottom this way. That is mostly how most coal burning fireboxes are set up. There's a lot more details to it. There's a lot of different kinds depending on what kind of coal you're burning or even what country the locomotive's in. In the case of a 491, there are, there's no damping control. There's no way to change the airflow in. Some British locomotives had dampers which allowed you to control the airflow into the firebox from the bottom. And a lot of wood burning locomotives also had that. And albeit, I will admit, I do not know much about wood burning firebox setups other than they're usually a little bit deeper uh, than a coal burning firebox so that you can have more wood in. But I don't know other than having dampers how they're different otherwise. So if uh, you have experience with a wood burner and wood burning firebox, I'd love to hear more about it. So what about the other big kind of firing, which is oil firing? So in oil firing, you don't have grates at all. You have basically a fire pan on the bottom that seals most of the bottom of the box off. You have typically a front damper and a rear damper, although this is going to be very specific to the locomotive, so you can allow air to come in from both sides. And then there are a number of different setups for it, but typically there's an opening at the front of the firebox where a burner sits, and the burner is basically a, a big... It's basically, uh, it looks like the, the front end of a vacuum cleaner almost, <laughs> the of one of the wands, uh, where there's a slot in it and it spits oil out. There's also a pipe that runs steam to the burner, which allows you to atomize the oil by using pressurized steam to scatter the oil into particles. So you have a valve for how much oil comes in, and you have a valve for how much atomization is given to that oil. And basically, you, you then make a fire that blows back towards the door which is usually just a little inspection hole rather than a door. Typically, you'll see a, an assembly that comes off the back to cover the manhole that is hinged, and then you can open it up to get in if you need to, but you typically look through just a cute little open little ring that you can, you know, check the fire on with. And as the locomotive works, the, the fire comes back and then circulates back and the exhaust gases come out. So the, the more pressure you use, the further you can send the fire back towards where you're at. And that is a, that is a really limited explanation of oil burning. Um, I only fired oil one time and uh, it didn't really, it wasn't really working tonnage by any means, so it, it wasn't too much for me to do, um, and it was just nine miles, so it wasn't really that big of a deal. But again, uh, if you know more about oil burning fireboxes, uh, or oil, oil burning, I'd love to hear about that as well, because I'm kind of a coal guy myself. The other important thing, particularly in an oil burning firebox, is that because the oil fire can change so dynamically, you have a valve that you could just dump more fire in instantaneously or remove it, your heat can change really quickly and the steel in the firebox doesn't like that. So typically oil burning fireboxes are lined with fire brick, a kind of refractory brick, which is a fancy word for brick that can get hot <laughs> uh, in a furnace application basically. The walls and the fire pan are typically lined with these bricks so that you have a layer of insulation so that if the fire suddenly goes out or suddenly gets stronger you have you know, something to protect the steel 
from the fire uh, and the rapid temperature changes because you've, you've basically got a heat capacitor at that point. And that's not to say that coal burning locomotives don't have refractory brick in them. 491 actually does. 491 has what's called thermic siphons, which is basically a pipe that connects the throat sheet of the firebox at the front to the crown sheet and then it's got a stayed area that's fanned up here so it's open so water basically comes down and to the coolest region of the boiler then it gets shot up this as it gets heated up super quickly by the fire because these pipes run right above it and then it proceeds to circulate and you get a convection current and we talked about the steam engine heartbeat that these siphoned engines have and I've got a little video of it on my channel that's what causes that but on top of those siphons there's actually what is called the brick arch or the arch brick so if you look at the firebox uh, from the back as you see it through the door you basically have the front of the firebox and all the tubes are up here you know running through to the the smoke box very exciting but you have the two siphons which come up at an angle so they're a little difficult to draw from this perspective but they kind of go like that and then you have the arch brick that sits between the siphons and then off to the side and so that brick comes up about this far and what that does is it causes the airflow through the firebox to go around the brick arch before it goes out and into the tubes. And this can help, A, reduce the amount of cinders you get out the stack, but B, it also increases your heating time in the firebox because rather than short cycling straight out the tubes, you keep that heat inside the box for longer. And it also changes how the fire actually drafts because one of the big things about a coal burning engine is where you place the coal on that big grid of grates is really really important you have to be good at aiming with the shovel and the firebox on, on 491 i mean it's a pretty sizable firebox it uh the whole thing with those four quadrants like we talked about it's about five and a half by nine and a half feet so five and a half here nine and a half here so that means your throw from the door to one of the front corners is something on the order of 11 12 feet and that's a long way to go with 50 pound scoops of coal <laughs> And sometimes, depending on how the locomotive drafts and how it works and what's going on in the ash pan, different regions of the fire will burn hotter than other ones. In the case of 491, 491 really likes to burn hot at the front and the sides. So you really end up shoveling more coal up in the front and sides, and you kind of leave the back alone, more or less. Whereas on a lot of engines, like the K36s, they love it in the back. They burn super hot back there, and you get to pile up a ton of coal right up by the door while you're going up Coombrace. Every engine's a little different, and it's always kind of interesting. So that's a really, really basic look into the different firing styles and how they actually get set up in the firebox to work for locomotives. It gets even more complicated than that with the more modern steaming technologies that you got. And we could honestly probably do uh, a whole nother video about uh, the specifics of oil firing and coal firing. Cause I mean, the, the thought behind them is yes, you need to regulate a fire and make pressure and all that, but your day to day or in the moment is quite different. So what about level 10? Well, for level 10, I figured we could answer that operational question that everyone seems to ask that is a little bit difficult to explain, and that is, what is the difference between the Johnson bar and the throttle, or the reverser and the regulator, as it says in Railroads Online? Because right now in Railroads Online, you adjust them. Uh, it doesn't really matter which one you adjust, which is not accurate because it really does. So we know from levels 3 and 4, Four, that the Johnson bar from level three controls the radius rod, which limits the motion of the valve. And we know that the throttle from level four that controls the throttle valve up top. So you have one control that controls the amount of steam that goes to the valve. And then you have another control that sets how much steam goes to the piston. Now, the, the whole purpose of this and why we typically talk about running with the bar rather than running with the throttle is that if you're pulling tonnage you would have the throttle wide open giving it everything you can through here you'd regulate speed and power with the johnson bar and you'd want it typically as close to center as you can and as you need slow down and you need more power then you'd start bringing it further and further out so you get more and more the reason for that is when you limit the travel of the valve 
you're shutting off the steam flow to the cylinder before it's finished its power stroke. So if, if you have everything wide open, wide open, wide open, you're always, you basically have a continuous pipe from the boiler to the piston all the way down. You, you, you've got whatever pressure is in your boiler, that boiler pressure gets to what we call the steam chest in the valve and then presses on that piston and you're giving it that full pressure the whole time. And it's just, it's like you've got a, you know, it's like you got a crowd of people and they're all trying to rush to a stage at a concert or something. You've got that pressure of everyone pushing into everyone the whole way and the, until the piston exhausts and then it gets out. But as you limit the travel of the valve less and less, Rather than having that rush of people trying to get to a stage, you cut off the steam flow. And so you have less pressure pressing on the piston. But what that allows for is you get the actual expansion of the steam to have an effect. And what I mean when I say that is if you keep your boiler pressure pressed up all the way there and you always keep it at full pressure until it exhausts, the steam expands when it goes and leaves the stack, because steam expands a considerable amount, particularly the hotter it is, which is the whole purpose of these superheater units. So if you cut the steam off early with cutoff using the Johnson bar, you get the expansion of the steam doing the work of moving the piston. And so, yes, you lose pressure as it expands, but you still have so much force on the piston that it doesn't matter and the expansion of the steam keeps things moving, and then you exhaust out with less pressure when you're leaving, so the steam has done more work moving the piston, and you're wasting less out the stack, basically, if that makes sense. And so that is why we talk about efficiency with the Johnson bar. It's much more efficient to have the bar closer to center, but you get less power, right? And so that's why when you're starting, you have the bar all the way in the corner, radius rods all the way down, giving it everything because you need all that power to get going. But when you overcome the inertia, you get momentum, everything's going, the valve starts moving faster and faster, and the piston starts moving faster and faster, you bring it closer and closer to center as high as you can to keep things going. Okay, so <laughs> that was a whole lot of stuff all at once and hopefully it made sense so let, let's do a quick recap before we finish off here so we started at level zero look it's a train i don't know anything about train but it's a train level one okay well it's got a fire it's got water it makes steam and then the steam pushes a piston level two we need to have a dedicated firebox that is surrounded by water so we don't blow up and so that we get the maximum heat transfer to the water to make the most steam and we need air to feed the fire and we need the exhaust of the fire to go somewhere into what we call the smoke box at the front so we have a boiler a fire box and a smoke box level three we need to do things with that steam it's not just a piston that it presses on we have driving rods in red and valve rods in yellow that set up how the steam flows and actually allows us to get power level four we need that steam to get there in the first place. So we have a throttle assembly, and then some locomotives have superheater assemblies to deliver as much steam as hot as possible to the valve and then later the piston. Level five, we have a boiler and we need to understand how it's built so that we can ensure that it's safe and we can maintain it and understand the construction of what it looks like. We have several different courses. We have rivets, we have seams, we have stay bolts, we have crown stays, we have braces, we have tube sheets. Level six, we have a frame and it's made up of many different pieces, driving boxes, journal boxes that the axles run through with a shoe and a wedge. We have a suspension that allows those driving boxes to do what they need to do and transition the force from one axle to another as we go down the railroad. And we have binding straps on the underside of the journal boxes that allow us to remove the drivers if we need to. Level seven, we need to make sure we can keep water in the boiler so that we don't explode. So we have an injection system that takes water from the tender, puts it into the boiler from the injector, starting valve, and check valve. And that injection system gets its steam from the turret that takes steam from the steam dome and spreads it to our various appliances, our electric generator or dynamo, our air compressor, which is on the other side, the injectors, the blower, lots of things are powered by the steam from the turret. Level eight, we have an air compressor that supplies air to our main reservoirs. We need to cool that air down 
and store it and make sure we have enough to operate the brakes on our train. The air also operates the sand dome. It also operates the ding ding in the bell. Level nine, we have a firebox. And it's very different depending on what kind of locomotive you have. Coal burning engines have grates. Some of them have dampers and you have refractory brick. Oil burners have a dedicated burner that spits oil that has been atomized by steam, continuously burns, and has refractory brick to make sure that the instantaneous heat changes don't cause any issues in the boiler. And wood burners are similar to coal burners, but a little bit different. And finally, level 10, the age-old Johnson bar versus throttle, reverser versus regulator. Honestly, this is why I prefer the term Johnson bar than reverser, because it does more than just reverse the direction that you're Aiming. That is my absolute crash course on starting to understand steam locomotives on a deeper level, specifically 10 different levels of understanding for steam locomotives. There's still so much more that we didn't even get to, but this was getting to most of the basics. If you guys enjoyed this, let me know and, and we can start talking about some of the more specific things. For example, we didn't talk about lubrication. We didn't talk about blowdowns. We didn't talk about safety valves. We didn't talk about how the whistle works even. Uh, <laughs> we didn't talk about the cab setup or the electrical distribution or, or we, we very just briefly talked about air brakes and how those are controlled. There's so much to learn about these, but I hope that this video has gotten you to a point where you can look at this and not just go, okay, it's a train, but that you can see that we have a smoke box and a boiler and this is the firebox and I've got a frame with axles and there's, there's driving boxes and this isn't just some big thing. It's a cylinder and then the valve lives on top of it. And oh my goodness, there's all these rods, but what do they do? Well, actually, I know what they do now. Uh, I hope that you guys can start to see the locomotives in that light and gain a better understanding of, of what we do on the railroad and hopefully understand more of the advanced topics that we'll talk about in videos moving forward. So anyways, thanks so much for watching, guys. Please let me know if you like this. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking through it and... Uh, <laughs> I really had to make sure I confirmed my own understanding on some of this too, because, you know, I'm not an expert in this by any means. There are plenty of people who know Steam a lot better than I do. I, I just know enough to be a little dangerous, as it were. So, uh, anyways, thanks so much for watching. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and let me know what you'd like to see next time. So, thanks for watching.